But Joe has one very dark secret. He's stealing money from clients to finance their fund. He preyed on people that were friends and family. He didn't prey on strangers. There was nobody he would not steal money from. How far will Joe Corona go to keep his sins a secret? I started crying and I said, I don't want to believe this. Please tell me he didn't do this to her. I don't want to believe it. Saturday, October 25th, 2008. Just outside Memphis, Tennessee, in the quiet suburb of Olive Branch. Shortly after 7 o'clock in the evening, Carrie Brown, a trucking company manager, receives an alarming phone call. It's Joe Corona, the husband of her close friend, Tina Corona. He sounds worried. He just called somewhat panicky and just said, have you talked to Tina today? And I'm like, no. Has she called you today? No, Joe, what's going on? Corona explains that he last saw Tina around 10 o'clock that morning when she left home in her black Chevy Avalanche. She planned to run errands in preparation for a party later that evening. But she never came home, Corona says. And she isn't answering her phone. Well, I went into a straight panic because that's not like her, especially not to answer phone calls from him. Tina Corona is a 44-year-old financial executive and president of the Memphis Corvette Club. She is so well-loved that friends and family immediately form a search party that very night. They were thinking somebody had abducted her, so I just went looking for that black avalanche. It was like a, a massive manhunt for Tina. The mystery of Tina Corona's disappearance would eventually reveal a sordid financial fraud scheme and murder plot. But just how did Tina and Joe Corona, by all appearances a happy and successful couple, become entangled in this twisted tale? It's a story that begins decades earlier. I don't know anybody that didn't love Tina. She was the kind of person that you, uh... You had no choice but to love her, really. Carrie Brown meets Tina in kindergarten. The two women stay tight through high school and college, and even get their first jobs together as tellers at a local bank. Customers that adored her would wait until she got back from lunch until she helped them. She's just that kind of person. She was magnetic. Although she does not have a degree in business or finance, Tina's infectious personality and strong work ethic propel her up the corporate ladder. Within a few years, she's working for the brokerage firm Payne Weber. She could talk a heating blanket from an Eskimo. She could sell anything. She could make every customer that walked in there happy. In early 1993, Tina meets her match in the charm department. One afternoon, while out shopping, Tina is swept off her feet by a smooth-talking shoe salesman. She didn't was like, you're not going to believe this. But I just met somebody at the shoe carnival, and we're going out. Joe Corona is a manager at the store. He knew all the right buttons to push with Tina. Lots of attention, flowers all the time, gifts all the time, really winning her over. Less than a year after meeting, the two are married. But shortly after the wedding, Tina pushes her new husband for a career change. She thinks he can do better than slinging shoes. So that's when she came to her dad and said, will you take Joe in and train him the insurance business? Tina's dad, Jim Murphy, is an independent insurance agent. He's eager to teach his new son-in-law the ropes. Two of Joe Corona's earliest clients are his elderly neighbors, Lake and Helen Sturdivant. Their son, David, remembers when Corona first came to call on them. He would come over to my parents' house and practice his sales pitch on them, have a live somebody to, to tell about the product he was, he was selling. Because they adore Tina, 
the Sturtevans are willing to take a chance with her new husband. They agree to let Joe open up an annuity for them. They thought it was a safe deal, and I think they thought they'd be helping out Tina by investing with them. An annuity is a financial product that is often used to create a future revenue stream in retirement. When you buy an annuity, you're buying an investment, and you're expecting your money to grow in value, and it's really considered a, a safe investment. It, there's not a lot of risk involved with an annuity. Joe Corona's new career is off to a promising start. When American Greed returns, Corona takes a high-stakes gamble with his family's fortune. Joe loved to gamble. Joe and Tina both went to the casinos a lot. No one ever knew how much money that he was spending at casinos. Memphis, Tennessee, home of the legendary Beale Street, where seven days a week there's always a party going on. And by 2006, the good times are rolling for Joe and Tina Corona. That year, Tina takes an executive job with the financial firm Cantor Fitzgerald. As a vice president in the loan department, she's paid nearly a quarter million dollars a year, according to her good friend, Carrie Brown. Everyone knew that she was successful and was doing well, that she would never take the credit for all that. She'd be like, oh, Joe's done so well, you know, in the insurance business, he's doing so well. But she's being far too humble. Most of Joe's clients are Tina's friends. She often accompanies her husband on sales calls. Anybody that knew Tina would go with them, but that was his bread and butter people who trusted Tina, therefore they could trust Joe. With years of experience under his belt, Joe now works out of his own office and away from the watchful eye of his father-in-law. Carrie Brown eventually becomes one of his clients. She purchases a life insurance policy through Joe and considers opening up a $20,000 annuity with him as well. I said, you know, I've got some money invested in an annuity. It just would make more sense if I put it with someone that I know. So why don't I move my money to you? And Tina was like, it's a great idea. Of course you can move your money to Joe. But rather than make a phone call and transfer money over to the life insurance company, Joe curiously tells Carrie to make out a check to his business. He said, just call your broker and tell him that you want a check in full made out to you. You'll sign that check over to me, and then I will invest it with Allianz in the same type of annuity. Carrie doesn't think twice about the transaction. Joe is the husband of her good friend, Tina. Complete 100% trust. She was involved. I mean, she was there. She helped sell it. With his insurance business thriving, Joe picks up a new hobby, collecting classic cars. Within a few years, Joe buys a 1971 Chevelle, a 1969 Daytona yellow Corvette, and a couple of Porsches. He liked to be seen in them. He was very proud of his cars. Joe becomes so enamored of his cars that he and Tina join the exclusive Memphis Corvette Club. It's a defining moment, says Tina's younger brother, Scott Murphy. Joe was all about the appearance of what you had. He was looking to hang out with the people that were in a different class that he felt like had money. Joe and Tina moved to a bigger house in Cordoba, a quiet town in the eastern suburbs of Memphis. The couple are high rollers at the casinos in Tunica, Mississippi, where Joe plays fast and loose with their cash. Joe loved to gamble. Joe and Tina both went to the casinos a lot. She hit 10 grand one time, and she was like, it's so much fun. I mean, we're addicted, you know, because we're winning all this money. But what Tina doesn't yet realize is that like any addiction, there can be hell to pay. Joe is losing a ton of money. It's not uncommon for him to drop several thousand dollars playing blackjack and high-end slots. He won money, but not enough to cover what he was losing. 
At one point, I think he was down $90,000. Next on American Greed, Joe Corona loves life in the fast lane. But will he drive his friends, family, and clients into a financial ditch? I never really saw he would try to steal money from the family. In Memphis, Joe and Tina Corona appear to have the perfect marriage. But what Tina doesn't know is that their lifestyle is propped up by fraud. Joe's been pocketing his clients' money for years, says Shelby County Assistant DA Danielle McCullum. Tina made good money, but I guess that wasn't enough, and he wanted more cars or a bigger house or to go gamble more. Since 2001, Joe's been stealing money from several clients. He makes it look easy. When Joe sells an annuity to a customer, he often encourages them to write the check directly to him. The check many times will be made payable to Corona Investments, and Joe would deposit that money to his account, and he would never forward that money to the insurance company. Some checks went to the insurance companies. Some checks went to him. He was very good at what he was doing, so he would mix it up. Corona's first ever client, Lake Sturdivant, remains his favorite mark. My dad loved Joe to death. Joe was telling him about all this interest that he was making. And when they would come into some money, most of the time would invest it with Joe. Unfortunately, Lake rarely asks Joe for any paperwork. It's a mistake made by several of Joe's clients, including Carrie Brown, who has a $20,000 annuity with Joe. I never got one statement, ever. At the time, the market was not doing well, so I didn't want to look at it. When clients do press Joe on the subject, he often whips up a fake document. The amount of time he spent defrauding these people is ridiculous. He would go through and, and change the amounts. He would retype parts and then repaste that on top and then photocopy it. Remarkably, while Joe is plundering their friends and family, Tina Corona, vice president of a financial firm, has no idea of the fraud happening right under her nose. Joe was very controlling of a lot of things in the relationship, but especially the money. He did handle all of the finances. She said, I don't even realize what I make because it goes into a direct deposit into the account, and Joe gave her allowance. If she needed money, Joe gave her the money. In June 2007, tragedy strikes Tina's family, and Joe's greed reaches new depths. One night after Jim Murphy attends a classic car show, the 65-year-old dies in his sleep. She called me about 5 o'clock in the morning, and she was absolutely beside her. I mean, just, Carrie Daddy died, you know, Carrie Daddy died. While his wife grieves, Joe turns his attention to his father-in-law's car collection. It includes a 1963 Cadillac, a Bentley, and several others worth more than $100,000. He came to me and said, your mom's got six, seven, eight cars out there that your dad had, and they're not doing anything but losing value, but I'll be glad to help you guys sell it. The Murphys agree, but Tina's brother, Scott, soon finds out that Joe may not be the trustworthy brother-in-law he thought he was. When Joe was selling the cars, Instead of having the checks made out to my mother, Joe was having the checks made out to Joe Corona. Joe deposits some cash in Clara's account, but the totals are far less than what the family expects. The family calculates that Joe has shorted them between thirty and forty thousand dollars. He had a Nash that he claims he sold for sixteen thousand dollars right there alone. 
uh, would have easily, somebody had come up and dropped 25,000 cash on it. The 57 Chevrolet, he let it go for 16,000. The Chevy's fair market value is $25,000. Two months after the funeral, on August 22, 2007, the family gathers to discuss the transaction. Joe is visibly anxious. He's sweating, he's shaking. We've just about got him cornered up in a wall. Joe denies any wrongdoing and tries to talk his way out of the situation. But Scott is armed with solid evidence that Joe has pocketed money owed to the family. He has already contacted the buyer of the 1963 Cadillac, who confirms he paid $12,000 cash for the car. But the Murphys haven't seen a penny. Well, at first he said, I made the deposit the day of the funeral, and Tina said, Joe, we didn't even go to the bank that day. So that's when he got up from the table. Joe Corona leaves the house and heads outside to his car. A few minutes later, he returns with a stack of cash. My sister says, you guys are not going to believe this. He found the money. It fell in between his seats, and it has been there for two solid months, and it was $4,000. And I was like, hallelujah, $4,000. Now, where's the other $8,000? In the face of damning evidence, Tina stands by her man. It's like she didn't believe us that she believed Joe. Because she got up after it was all over with, she got up and said, I've lost my family. That night, Joe writes a check to his mother-in-law for $35,000. The next day, he pays Scott the other $8,000. Joe and Tina proceed to break off all contact with the Murphys. Oh, it's like a knife sticking me in my heart. I tried to talk to her. I'd call her at the office and she wouldn't answer my call. Well, I'd send her emails, she wouldn't answer my emails. Next on American Greed, is there anything Joe Corona won't do for money? Or to keep his secrets hidden? I said I don't want to believe that he's done something wrong, but there's no doubt that he has. And later, Joe Corona's exclusive interview with American Greed. I just believe that the truth needs to come out. My side has never been told, and my family and obviously all the people that were involved uh, need to know, you know, what happened. In Memphis, Joe Corona's greed has opened up a family rift. After his in-laws, the Murphys, accuse him of stealing their money, Tina Corona and her mom stopped talking. She used to drive by our moms at Thanksgiving, Christmas, see who's there, cry. People have no idea how much that devastated her. It was bad. While his wife quietly suffers, the first cracks start to appear in Joe's scam. In March 2008, Carrie Brown wants to cash out part of her $25,000 annuity. She needs 10 grand to pay off some bills. She tried to talk me out of it, and I insisted that it was my money. Give it to me. I want to pay some debt off. For the next three weeks, Carrie waits for the money to be transferred in her bank account. But it never arrives. On the third week, I called him. And I felt at the time, what is, what's the deal? I've taken money out of investment accounts before. It's never taken this long. A few days later, the money is finally deposited. But curiously, the wire transfer doesn't come from the insurance company. Tina's name was on that transfer. And at the time, I thought it was odd, but I got my money. That's all I cared about. Carrie Brown never mentions the incident to Tina. Besides, Tina has exciting news of her own that she can't wait to share with her friend. She's planning on buying a new home, a half-million-dollar house in the upscale suburb of Eads, where many of her Corvette Club friends live. She was 
She was so excited about the house. She had been wanting to buy a house out in that area for a really long time. For years, Joe has quashed his wife's plan of buying a bigger home, telling her they have other expenses that need to be addressed first. The truth is, Joe can't risk exposing his personal finances to the mortgage lenders. According to Danielle McCollum of the Shelby County DA's office, Joe is worried his fraud will be revealed. He knew what the ramifications would be as far as the financial truth starting to come out. And then Tina was going to start asking questions about that. And it was just going to be a snowball effect before she knew everything. But Tina is persistent. She won't take no for an answer. In October 2008, Joe finally gives in. They'll buy the dream house. Tina's so happy, on October 23rd, she shares the big news with her girlfriends. According to Carrie Brown, Tina explains that Joe has found a buyer for their current home, and they're going to be closing on the new house that weekend. She goes, oh, girl, it's so great. We've already sold it. They're paying us cash. Unfortunately, Tina never gets a chance to move into her dream house. As two days later, on Saturday, October 25th, something unexpected strikes. Next on American Greed. Well, I was just devastated. And I pulled up and, I mean, I was hurling. I lost it. It was just shock. Shock. To learn more about Joe Corona's secrets, go to americangreed.cnbc.com. Want inside information from behind the scenes of the show? Join the Greed Social Network. Like us on American Greed's Facebook page. We'll be right back. It's a crisp fall day on Saturday, October 25th, 2008. Joe Corona plans to have a lazy day tinkering on his car at a friend's house. While his wife, Tina, is out getting party supplies for a Corvette Club shindig that night. But by 6 p.m., Tina hasn't come home from her errands. It's not like her to be late. Around 7 p.m., Joe Corona starts calling Tina's friends. He just called somewhat panicky and just said, have you talked to Tina today? And I'm like, no. Has she called you today? No, Joe, what's going on? Around this time, the Corvette Club party is just starting when Joe calls. And then he starts calling all the people at the party. Have you guys seen Tina? I haven't seen her, haven't heard from her. Tina's friends are worried, and the party quickly changes into a search party. They spread out and hit all of Tina's regular shopping places, posting flyers and searching for her SUV. And that's when everyone starts to get really nervous and driving all over the city looking for that black avalanche. See if it's on the side of the road, maybe she broke down. On Sunday, the search continues, but there's still no sign of Tina. Sunday at 1 o'clock till probably 1 o'clock in the morning, I drove around everywhere looking for my sister. I don't even know what I was looking for. On Monday morning, October 27th, Police find a black SUV on a residential street in the Memphis suburb of Bartlett. Kevin Martin is a Bartlett detective. He's one of the first officers on the scene. I went up and basically looked into the back and I could see form of a, of a body laying in the back floorboard of this avalanche. The license plates match the missing vehicle. Inside, police find what they already suspect, the lifeless body of Tina Corona. There are no bullet or stab wounds, so it's unclear how she died. Given Memphis's reputation for violent crime, police at first think Tina Corona is yet another victim of a carjacking and robbery gone wrong. That theory changes upon closer inspection of the crime scene. Her hands were duct taped. They were loose, and they weren't even connected. It looked like somebody tried to, to 
to make it look like her hands had been tied up, which they weren't. She had diamond rings on both hands, earrings. And that stuck out like a sore thumb to us. A bad guy in this area is not going to leave $30,000, $35,000 ring on somebody's finger. Friends and family are gathered at Joe and Tina's house when police deliver the devastating news. As they were showing the picture of her dead body to him, there was no emotion. He just shook his head, yes, like, you know, that's her. He acted like he couldn't walk. It was all like, oh, I have no strength, I'm so weak. The next day, Bartlett police asked Joe to come in for a formal interview to learn what happened on the day Tina went missing. But you didn't know where she was going first. Nah, no, no, I didn't know where she was going. Joe tells officers he spent the day working on his Chevelle at a friend's house. And uh, you're doing your thing at the house, whatever. Well, yeah, and then, and, it had, and, and then I was over at a, a friend's house working okay. on two cars, okay. and, and I'm guessing I was there by, like, a little bit after 12. Joe's alibi checks out. But in the days following her murder, Tina's family grows suspicious of his behavior. He seems more giddy than grieving, and he's eager to move on. He cleaned out the house. Everything that was Tina's, he got rid of. Her clothes, her shoes, he even threw her Bible away and said, she ain't gonna need this anymore. Police investigate other suspects, but nothing sticks. After we started looking at the crime scene and looking at everything, it kept bringing us back to one person. But there's a problem. Police can't find any physical evidence that ties Joe Corona to the murder. No DNA, no murder weapon. And medical examiners can only determine that Tina died by asphyxiation. There was no indication whether she'd been suffocated and asphyxiated through suffocation or whether she had been strangled. The Corona house is beyond tainted, as friends contaminated the premises while searching for Tina. Over 100, 150 people have been in and out of the house over there where they lived. So any crime scene that we had over there would, would have been destroyed or wouldn't have been of any use. Lacking physical evidence, the case stalls. But three weeks later, police catch a critical break when Carrie Brown thinks back to her financial dealings with Joe. She remembers that Tina's name was on the wire transfer when she withdrew funds that were supposed to come from her annuity. She calls a friend at the bank and asks her to pull up the transaction. And she said, oh no, Carrie. I think this is fraudulent. I said, why? And she said, it came from their personal checking account at Regions Bank. A call to her insurance company confirms the suspicions of fraud. I called Allianz, and all they could verify was my life insurance. I said, no, I have an annuity. And this is when I opened it. Although Brown withdrew $10,000, she believes she still has an annuity worth $15,000. Well, do you have an account number? Well, no, because he never sent me anything, right? So, no, I don't. Carrie goes to the Bartlett police and tells them that she thinks Joe is running a scam. So we start thinking, well, Joe's taking money from her. What's he doing with it? And that's when we started looking at everything. All his financial stuff we started looking at. The police subpoena Corona's bank records and make a shocking discovery. One week after Tina's demise, Joe withdrew $30,000 from one of her annuities and forged his late wife's signature on the check. She had big, happy handwriting, and he scribbled it like, sorry, most men scribble. It was just and Tina Corona. That kind of caught our eye. You know, he's cashing out an annuity check in his wife's name. Police start to suspect that Tina's murder is inextricably linked to the couple's finances and Tina's dream of buying a new home. I think it's very clear that Tina thought they were closing very soon on this house. The only person that knew the truth was Joe, 
that there was no closing that was going to happen. Why he would continue to lead her on, in our opinion, was because he knew there, weren't, there wasn't going to be a closing. He knew he was going to have to kill her. Otherwise, all of this was going to come out. As a motive develops, the detectives bring in the IRS and the U.S. Postal Inspector. The investigators look deeper into Joe's insurance business and discover that he's stolen nearly $700,000. This is multiple people. As far as the amount of money that he stole, it was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. They said, wow, boy, did you open a box. You wouldn't believe what he's done to all these other people. The agencies reach out to Joe's victims. No one has any idea they've been swindled. Initially, the victims couldn't believe money had been stolen from them. And then when the victims started looking at their records, they realized there was a problem. Lake Sturdivant takes the biggest hit. He's lost more than $200,000. Daddy'd he sat there in his wheelchair and wring his hands, and he'd say, I just can't believe Joe would do something like that to a crippled old man. <laughs> In March 2009, five months after Tina's murder, the feds collect enough evidence of financial fraud to search Joe's house and seize his assets. At the same time, local prosecutors get a warrant for his arrest on suspicion of murdering Tina Corona. There's just one problem. Where's Joe? Yeah, he bolted. I think he knew that it was all coming to a head, and that's when he disappeared. For the next few weeks, police conduct a massive manhunt for Joe Corona, who's believed to be driving a gray Hummer. In late March, they finally catch a break when a McDonald's employee in Jackson, Tennessee, over 70 miles away, says Joe is a regular customer. He comes through her McDonald's drive through just about every morning for breakfast, and he's in a uh, gray uh, Hummer. Detective Martin and his partner begin to drive around Jackson searching for the vehicle. Incredibly, after just a few minutes, they spot a gray Hummer in a hotel parking lot. And so we drove by in the parking lot and looked over and we knew it was the car by the tag on the vehicle. We saw the tag and I was like, wow, it's him. The detectives contact the local authorities and assemble a task force. Accompanied by U.S. Marshals and Sheriff's deputies, police descend on Joe's hotel room. We were going to try an element of surprise. We were going to hit the door, unlock it, and come in and effect the arrest. But the door is latched, and they can't get in. The police call out to Joe. He doesn't respond. Officers grow tense when they hear a familiar sound inside the room. Next on American Greed. You could hear a racking sound. It's very distinct. In my line of work, I know what a slide on a weapon is going back and forth. And that's what it was. So we knew he was armed. After 17 days on the run, Police have cornered Joe Corona at a hotel in Jackson, Tennessee. But he isn't going quietly. Oh, it was high stress. We knew he was armed. We knew he had a weapon in there. Over the next several moments, officers try to reason with the fugitive. I was like, well, you need to come out. I'm not coming out. You know, I've got a gun in here. You, you could hear him racking it. And I'm like, yeah, Joe, we've got a lot of guns out here, too. You know, we don't want to resort to that. After 20 minutes, Joe finally relents. I just don't. All it's going to do is delay the inevitable of what's going to happen. You're going to go to jail. We're going to come and get you one way or another. Joe knows he's trapped. He puts down the gun and gives himself up. The manhunt is finally over. In an exclusive interview with American Greed, Joe Corona talks about the events of that day. According to him, the situation is blown out of proportion. There was no 
no harm stand up. By the time they knocked at the door and told the drawer, all I had to do was get back to get dressed before I opened the door to let them in. But there was no harm stand up. That's all garbage that they made up to make it look bad. The news of Joe's arrest spreads quickly. I was driving down the 64 highway, and Scott said they've arrested Joe, and I just started screaming. <laughs> I got out of the car, and I was just saying, thank you, God, thank you. <laughs> Over the next three years, Joe sits in jail, denied bail for being a flight risk, and waits for the murder case to go to trial. At the same time, federal prosecutors indict Joe on 57 counts of insurance fraud, mail fraud, and money laundering. Edward Stanton is the U.S. attorney for Western Tennessee. He preyed upon individuals he knew were vulnerable. We wanted to make sure that Joe uh, Carano was held accountable uh, to the fullest extent of the law. But before the federal case can proceed, the state must first move forward on the murder charge. It was very difficult because this wasn't a case about whether or not he stole money, but the financial part was a piece of the puzzle and whether or not he killed Tina. In October 2012, Joe Corona goes on trial for the murder of Tina Corona. Prosecutors paint him as a con man without a conscience. Someone who would rather commit murder than give up his posh lifestyle. Detective Martin believes that in the days leading up to the murder, Tina had inklings that Joe was a fraud. Either she received something in the mail or she found out or received a phone call. And I think she confronted him about that. And his whole world was going to be dissolved if she went and told anybody about what he was doing. In his interview with American Greed, Joe Corona disputes the accusation and insists he could never hurt Tina. I'm not a cold-blooded person. I've never done anything like that. That's no police involvement in anything. And I certainly couldn't kill anybody, much less Hawaii. Though the events of that day still aren't exactly known, prosecutors believe Joe suffocated Tina at their home on that Saturday morning. He then drove the avalanche to the spot where it was discovered. Cell phone records confirm Joe was in the area of where Tina's SUV was found. And there's one more fact linking Joe to the site. His storage unit, where he keeps his classic cars, is just a quarter mile away. When we looked at cell phone records, the records did show that Joe drove from his house and drove that direction into Bartlett. Joe told the police that he never went to the storage unit that day. Well, his cell phone records told us something very different. Joe's defense team argues that the police mishandled the crime scene and that there's no physical evidence linking him to Tina's murder. Ask the police, how did I do this? If they're so sure that I did it, how did I do it? Where did I do it? You know, none of those things were ever explained because they couldn't be explained because they don't know. After nine days of arguments, the jury retires to deliberate. It only takes them an hour and a half to reach a verdict. On November 1st, 2012, exactly four years to the day since Tina's funeral, Joe Corona is found guilty of first-degree murder. I just threw my hand back and said, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. I was just... I was happy. Joe is sentenced to life in prison. He isn't eligible for parole until 2063, when he'll be 99 years old. He'll be in prison for 50-something years for murdering my sister, and I am thankful for that. He will never see daylight. He will never come out of prison. He'll die in prison. On February 26, 2013, Joe pleads guilty to the federal indictment and gets another seven years tacked on to his prison sentence. The reason that I pled guilty out to those accounts is because that's what was in my best interest. I do not believe the system was after the truth. Um, I was not going to try to go to another trial again with a, an unpaid lawyer. 
The Fed say Joe stole nearly $800,000 from 18 clients. These victims were devastated. They had saved and planned on saving for themselves and their kids, and they lost their money. A number of these individuals, it was their life savings, retirement savings. These were not individuals that were looking for a get-rich-quick uh, uh, scheme or uh, an enormous return on investment. Lake Sturdivant is the biggest victim, losing more than $209,000. But Joe's first and best customer never receives any satisfaction as Lake passes away in 2010 at the age of 84. Some of the victims, including Kerry Brown, are compensated by the insurance companies that Corona claimed he had invested with. Others, however, are waiting for restitution from the court. We have seized uh, multiple vehicles, personal property against sports memorabilia, motorcycles. We're in the process of uh, uh, liquidating those, and, and uh, it's our hope that we will be able to uh, do everything we can uh, to provide uh, restitution to uh, the multiple victims here. To this day, Joe Corona believes Tina was murdered on a busy road close to where she was found and that the real killer is still on the loose. The bottom line is, a lot of the people I used to hang out with, their wives are on that same street every day. This is going to do it again. You know, and I just pray to God that it's not somebody else that, you know, that I know. But his victims say Joe Corona is where he belongs, behind bars and forced to account for his financial crimes and the murder of a woman that so many loved. Why did you steal from all these old people? Why did you kill Tina? I mean, it's gratifying that he'll pay for his crime. Still doesn't, doesn't change anything. It is what it is. I mean, she's gone. Do you know, I'd like for them to put a big picture of Tina on his wall where he couldn't get it down so he could see her every day and what he's done to her. I just wish we could have talked before all this happened. She could have